Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, we humbly implore your majesty that just as your only begotten Son was presented on this day in the temple in the substance of our flesh, so by your grace we may be presented to you with minds made pure through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Please extinguish your candles, and if you would, just as you're sitting down, now hold them for a few minutes. Let the wax dry before you set them down. Thank you. A reading from the book of the prophet Malachi. Thus says the Lord God, Lo, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me. And suddenly there will come to the temple the Lord whom you seek, and the messenger of the covenant whom you desire. Yes, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who will endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like the refiner's fire, or like the fuller's lie. He will sit refining and purifying silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi, refining them like gold or like silver, that they may offer due sacrifice to the Lord. Then the sacrifice of Judah and Jerusalem will please the Lord, as in the days of old, as in years gone by. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God.
reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Since the children share in blood and flesh, Jesus likewise shared in them, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who, who through fear of death had been subject to slavery all their life. Surely he did not help angels, but rather the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every way, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest before God to expiate the sins of the people. Because he himself was tested through what he suffered, he is able to help those who are being tested. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. be with you and with your spirit a reading from the holy gospel according to luke Glory to you, Lord. when the days were completed for their purification according to the law of moses mary and joseph took jesus up to jerusalem to present him to the lord just as it is written in the law of the lord Every male that opens the womb shall be consecrated to the Lord and to offer the sacrifice of a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons in accordance with the dictate in the law of the Lord. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, awaiting the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Christ of the Lord. He came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to perform the custom of the law in regard to him, he took him into his arms and blessed God, saying, Now, Master, you may let your servant go in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in sight of all the peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory for your people Israel. The child's father and mother were amazed at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be contradicted. And you yourself a sword will pierce so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived seven years with her husband after her marriage, and then as a widow until she was 84. 
she never left the temple, but worshiped night and day with fasting and prayer. And coming forward at that very time, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were awaiting the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had fulfilled all the prescriptions of the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. This feast of the presentation of our Lord is one of the more ancient feasts that the church celebrates. It even predates celebrating Christmas. The first great feast of the early church was Easter, along with Epiphany, as well as this feast. Christmas was a little later along the way. According to Jewish law, as we just heard in the gospel, 40 days after a first <clears throat> firstborn male is born, the parents of the child are to take him to Jerusalem, to the temple, to present him to the Lord. You see, according to the law of Moses, the firstborn male belonged to God. It was God's property, so to speak. But God, being generous and practical as well, the parents then had to redeem or purchase the child back. Otherwise, the temple, I guess, would be keep filling up with screaming babies, I suppose, after a while. So, obviously, there's practicality in there as well. So, if you were well off, which was very few people in the ancient world, you would sacrifice a lamb to redeem the child. Or if you were like Mary and Joseph and 99% of the rest of the people in the world at that time who were very poor, God was satisfied with two turtle doves or, or pigeons. And that's what Mary and Joseph did, is following the outward prescription of the law to redeem our Lord and to, to be able to bring him back home and raise him as their own child. Technically, all of us through baptism are the property, though, of, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and He has redeemed us. Mary and Joseph could not afford a lamb to redeem Him, but they were bringing to the temple the most perfect lamb, when you think about it, Jesus, the Lamb of God, who would offer His very life on the cross for our redemption. Now, somewhere in those early centuries of the church, they also attached onto the liturgy the blessing of candles as well. We know that candles certainly were, first of all, a very functional, practical thing to have within the churches because in those early centuries, the Sunday Mass was celebrated very early in the morning, long before the sun came up, meaning it was dark. You had to have light, and the only light you had in the ancient world was lamps, oil lamps, or candles. And so they used them for that reason, but eventually the church began to see a very spiritual significance about the candle as well. And that's what I'd like to just dwell upon for a little bit this morning is this simple, humble candle that we take for granted. We obviously still see an important need or use for them in the church because we still use them despite our electricity in this modern age. So their purpose no longer is not just to give us light, but obviously something far more spiritual as well. First of all, when you think of a candle, 
And when you light that candle, that flame needs something important to burn. Try lighting a candle in a vacuum. The flame needs oxygen to burn. And that oxygen, of course, is all around us. We breathe it in every day and every night, constantly. And the flame, too, needs that omnipresent oxygen, that air, to keep it flaming and alive. Now, you think of ourselves, who have also been called to be light, and in order for us to be true light, we need not the oxygen, well, we need that biologically, yes, but for our spiritual health, our spiritual journey, if we're going to keep the flame of our faith alive and healthy, we need to recognize that God who is omnipresent, who is always around us everywhere. But that's nice, but we need to keep reminding ourselves of that in every situation of our life and throughout the day. You know, it's easy for us to be, hopefully it's easy for us to be thinking about God when we're inside our holy places. But for most of us, you're only here for an hour a week. And then there's the rest of the week. And then the rest of the day. We say our prayers, yes. We're conscious of God at that point in time, but how about the rest of the day? Are we working at really visibly reminding ourselves that we really need God. We do. You see, one of the challenges of our culture today, and that's why it's, this is our challenge, is we've created such a convenient world for ourselves. It's easy for so many now to say, I don't need God. That's really what the world is doing more and more. I don't need God. I have enough of my own resources, of my own working hands, that I don't really need God. What you're really doing is you're dispelling the oxygen that the flame of faith needs when we say we don't need God. We do need God, and if there's any time at all that we really need Him, it's in these times. We need to cry out to Him and be recognizing His presence all around us. So that's the first thing that this flame and this candle teach us. The second thing that the candle teaches me is that for it to burn efficiently, it has to stay away from bad influences. If you bought a, cal a can candle at the store, particularly if it's one of those big pillar candles, if you turn it over and read the bottom usually, it gives you a little bit of instruction it tells you to never light the candle in a drafty place. Wind and breeze are not friendly to candles. Even the slightest little breeze will cause it to make a mess. But take it out into the wind outside and poof, it goes out. It no longer can serve its purpose. And again, we can be reminded of the same thing. We need to be most careful of what influences are around me and affecting my light of faith as well. And there are many, many influences out there that are assaulting our faith, whether they be persons, but perhaps even more so obtrusively is unfortunately something that could be of great value to us has really turned into being really a handicap to us. The television. The majority of what's on television now is completely opposed to what the gospel preaches of Jesus Christ. And that message, when we hear it in a very subtle way, and that's really how it all began. It's funny because I always love, I don't watch a lot of, I don't watch anything new anymore on television. I don't really find anything valuable on television anymore that's, that's new to watch. So I like to watch the old shows. But even as I watch those old shows, even way back in the 50s and 60s, 
I see already creeping in there very subtly values being preached and taught in a very subtle way that are not the gospel of Christ. And so we need to be very wary of that stranger that we've invited into our homes that we call television and be most sensitive to the type of programming we are watching and most especially what the younger ears are listening to and picking up. You'd be amazed at how many people believe everything they see on television. Case in point, Gilligan's Island. There was actually people in the 60s who actually believed that there were seven castaways stranded on an island, and they actually wrote to CBS and asked them to rescue them. I kid you not. If we believe that, or some people believe that, can you imagine what some of these immoral messages that are being taught and what's sticking in our Christian faith? Wrong influences. What are our influences? We need to have Christian influences. And finally, what the candle does. How does that candle give light? It literally melts away. It burns itself up. It consumes itself in order to give light. In other words, this candle sacrifices itself to give us light. And the same is being asked of us as Jesus did first. He sacrificed his whole life. His entire being was consumed on that cross so that we may have life. And the candle reminds us as light of the world that we too need to not be selfish, but to be emptying, to be self-giving and sacrificial. A word again that this culture does not like to hear because sacrifice means inconvenience, pain, and that's what the gospel's all about sacrifice, the cross. If you don't believe me, don't believe what it says on TV. Read the book. It's the gospel. It's what Jesus preached and taught, not only with his words, but with his very life as well. Candles by themselves lit are nice in a dark room, all alone, but many candles lit in that same room is even better. And so as the light of Christ that we've been entrusted with in baptism, we are to also share that light. We are called to be evangelists. We are called to proclaim that good news, that Jesus indeed is here to dispel the darkness of this world. As Isaiah the prophet said long ago, a people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. Jesus is that light. He has shared that light with us. We do not keep it beneath a bushel basket. We place it on the table of our lives and proclaim it with our love and with our works. So let us use these candles today to remind us the sacramental way that Jesus is light and we share in that light.